then it's time for the first talk of today. The first talk will be delivered by somebody working in the automotive industry. And it seems to be um, a strange choice. I mean, we're dealing with spaces here. So why somebody from the car industry? Well, actually, the car industry isn't what it used to be. The car industry is making some rapid changes. And Dominique Dauphin is the guy who can tell you which changes they are and what you can expect from the automotive industry in the future. He has been working in the car industry for almost all of his life and now is um, the international senior industrial designer of Yanfang. It's a Chinese company, a chi Chinese company that again I think no one, has, no one of us has ever heard of before. But make no mistake, this very company produces interior components for almost all of the other car brands. So they supply interior components for the car industry in general. And Dominique has a special role in this company. He is looking into the future. So he's the lead of advanced design. So he's working on future mobility concepts. I'm saying mobility, I'm not saying cars. So how will those changes in mobility influence the way we live, the way we work and the world that surrounds us in general? That's the big question. And he will provide some insights and some answers. Please welcome Dominique Taffin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Robert. Um, yes, so I will try to give you a little bit an insight about uh, how mobility in the future will change the way we live and work. However, uh, as an introduction, I would like to say that uh, basically the uh, automotive world and the new mobility world is actually very inspired by all the living spaces that you probably know very well and that we are seeing a kind of uh, disappearance of frontiers and everything being mixed up a little bit. So I think that uh, as it has been said in the introduction, we are going through a, a period of time where actually everything is being blurred. And um, as an automotive interior parts supplier, we are, of course, uh, very interested in what is happening. So just a very short introduction, as uh, the company is probably not very well known. Yangfang Interiors, uh, Automotive Interiors is the global leader in automotive interiors in the sense that um, this company is providing almost every manufacturer worldwide with interior components, which is basically everything that contributes to the experience of the user in the vehicle, so the visible parts. We are not in, in hardware technology parts, but we are really creating the interiors from the manufacturing point of view. Um, Yangfang Automotive Interiors is a Chinese company uh, which is actually has taken over Johnson Controls, which used to be a very strong at that time in, uh, in, in, in worldwide, but Johnson Controls was dismantled from the automotive point of view, which means that actually we have a much wider and a much bigger uh, uh, footprint than uh, Johnson Controls. We are in 113 different places worldwide, uh, 30,000 people, uh, employed worldwide and our turnover is around nine mil nine billion uh, dollars per year uh, we have as well design activities in three places in uh, Europe and the United States and in uh, and in uh, in China and uh, as I think uh, Robert said I, I have this honor to work on everything that is connected to the future whatever this can mean of course because predicting the future is always very difficult so the future will be fluffy. Why do I say that? Because today we live in an environment where actually boundaries tend to disappear. We do not know where we are, and we may be not knowing even where we are going. To a certain degree, the future cannot be predicted as everything is melting together. So I use the word fluffy because it is actually like a piece of cotton. It is there, you like it, it's very pleasant, but you don't know really where it stops, and you don't know where it's going to expand. One of the very interesting questions today is actually to understand where does something start and where does something end? And uh, if you're talking about experience worlds, basically that is exactly 
what the question is. And if you look at what future mobility in the future is, I think that we do not have a concept of immobility anymore. The, co the connections between boundaries and uh, the way we see things are maybe redefined or maybe even lost because of the fact that you have this melting between analog and digital. And one thing, one thing that is really very interesting about what we are going through today, and uh, I think I have in front of me really specialists of what experience is, um, is that you can actually consider that we are going through an infin infinite extension. I shall go a little bit into details about this, but basically, like everything else, you have opposites that attract each other, and analog and versus digital are actually things that are completely opposite, but still very complementary. To a certain extent, we have already seen everything that is palpable. We live in a physical world. If you look at history and if you look at all the evolutions that you have gone through, you can see that we have already been able to almost live everything. Okay, not everybody has been on space or walked on the moon, but the way things are going to change are probably going to be changing through digital as well. One of the one of the things that we are still working with, though, is the fact that we have a heritage of materiality, which is the past of, uh, of our experiences, which means that if we want to evolve and if we want to go further, the fact that we can go with the digital world, we have the possibility to change our thought process as well, which can become much, much more wider. One thing that as well is interesting is that the digital world asks for a reconsideration how we do things. I think this is really essential, especially if you think about the way we move around and the way we are going, we are going to, to experience the next 10 years, is that we will have a complete mix between what we can see, what we can touch, and what we can actually extrapolate. Of course, this means that there are going to be challenges and that we might still struggle how to connect these two worlds because of the fact that we are just going through this revolution today. However, it allows you to go through infinite possibilities because on one side we have dreams and on one side, of course, we can see how things are going to be evolving. The question, though, that is interesting to, uh, to ask is if we really need more than what we have today, in the sense that through the extension of the digital digitization, we might, need go, we might go to a, to a stage which is going to be something that disconnects us from reality. Science fiction has become fiction, actually, in the sense that in the past, technology was not offering enough possibilities to go further, whereas today technology is stronger than whatever we can invent, and therefore the possibilities are infinite. However, if we are looking at what mobility solutions in the future are, you are, I think, aware of the fact that today everybody is talking about a certain way about how autonomous drive can eventually be introduced everywhere how all the mobility solutions are going to change the world. What we forget is that actually 90% of the population is living in conditions that we do not e experience every day and that therefore we as so-called developing countries are maybe developing scenarios that are not adapted to what the world needs. Maybe we have, we forget a global approach. To a certain extent, we create small islands of differentiation because of the fact that we are only thinking about what is really around us instead of looking at how things could be seen really globally and connected to real needs. So the question is, are the solutions we work on and are these the, ans the, the solutions we work on giving us the answers we need? Sometimes we forgot to simplify in the sense that Having thought about too many, too many elements that are connected to the technology that we have our, at our disposal, we think that these are the solutions 
that will be the answers. What I would like to ask is what kind of solutions we need for a global approach in order to make sure that if we are talking about future mobility solutions, we are going to think about solutions that are actually useful for the whole population on the planet and not only for a relatively limited amount of people. The other question that I would like to ask is if new, new mobility is only autonomous. I think everyone is aware of the fact that the automotive industry is promoting very heavily a very simplified scenario about what mobility is going to be in the future. Maybe transfer, may, mainly transferring the process of driving yourself into a tro process of being driven, but without integrating it into all the other systems that do exist. Of course, this means that a lot of people are going to panic if these new mobility solutions are going to, uh, uh, to get introduced. And for example, if you think about the lawyers, they might actually not be amused because new mobility solutions and autonomous drive or any kind of uh, mobility uh, system is going to remove the responsibility of the human being into the movement. To a certain extent, it will shift from the individual to a group. As you are aware of the fact, the scenarios that we are talking about today are scenarios where basically the human interface is not going to be uh, necessarily anymore to move from one point to, to one point to another. And of course, that means that a lot of people are going to be out of business. The other thing as well is that the governments are behind in certain countries and lobbyists are behind because they still do not understand exactly how all these changes are going to influence the future of business. Another example are the insurance companies. The insurance companies will have to reconsider their business model because, of course, if there is a risk of reduction through autonomous drive, uh, it means that there is going to be a loss of income. That means that a big paradigm shift will happen and will have to happen. I think you can compare it to the beginning of the 20th century where horses were used to, to, for transportation and when mechanical means of transportation arrived, suddenly the whole picture of transportation moved. That means that people had to change jobs, companies had to change the way they approach everything related to, to mobility. And I think that with the new mobility solutions, especially if they are very global and very integrated, it is going as well to have a, a, a huge influence on how we see things happening. Of course, after panic, there will be ecstasy, in a sense that we are going to go through a new dimension. I cannot predict this new dimension, in the sense that I don't have a crystal ball, and to a certain extent, a lot of predictions that have been done never came true, but what we can see is that there are certain trends that are obviously uh, observable, and one of the trends is that the possibilities will become endless. I'm actually very optimistic about what, uh, what, what can be done if we have a, a completely integrated uh, transportation system because it is going to change many things, in my opinion, uh, in our environment. One thing that is going to be very interesting is that you will have a full integration of travel scenarios. Today, if you are traveling to a certain extent, and it depends, of course, where you are, certain cities are more organized than others, you still have to plan pretty well what you are doing. What is fascinating about the future of mobility is that you probably will be as free as you are today to walk around and that you do not need really to plan anything because you will have a connection of everything that will bring you from one point A to point B. The other thing as well is that it will offer access to people who do not have mobility. We always forget very often that in the world population, a high percentage of people don't have access to mobility. They don't have the money, or they don't have the capabilities because they don't have a driver's license, or maybe they are physically impaired, or maybe they are too old. Anyway, people that are actually suffering from the lack of mobility and they, that they would need. 
what I mentioned before, it's going to be like a complete freedom in my opinion. Of course, I'm, I'm very optimistic in the sense that I think that this is going to change a, a lot of things. On the other hand, there are of course other considerations that have to be considered. What is going to happen, for example, to cities? This, of course, here is a scenario which is basically a scenario that is taking in consideration uh, a future mobility scenario for car sharing. But this is not so important because basically it is not important how it's going to be implemented, but the scenarios that are going to be extrapolated from this. If you think about cities today, and maybe Amsterdam is not the best example because you have removed already quite a lot of cars from the city, uh, Strasbourg, for example, was one of the pioneering cities as well to remove cars uh, out of, of the cities. If you think about cities, the potential is going to be fantastic. Silence, harmony, but it's going to have as well an influence on urban planning. As I mentioned before, your planning today has been heavily depending on the way systems have been put together. Building along a road or building along a railroad track. Whereas in the future, if systems are much more integrated, there will be much, a much bigger freedom. What is interesting for the cities as well, and just as an example, is that mobility can be controlled by the cities again. So don't understand me wrong, I'm not for control, but today a lot of cities are suffering from the fact that they cannot control mobility and therefore need to react to a, to a phenomena rather than trying to uh, plan according to this phenomena. It's like a sick patient, instead of trying to keep a patient in good health, you're just trying to put a couple of plasters on him. Another thing is optimization of uh, land footprint. You know very well that because of the, uh, act of, of the, current, uh, of the current infrastructure, land footprint has been designed in a certain way, which means that you have islands that are very interesting for the user and other areas that are not interesting. With future mobility, this could be, uh, could be fragmented in the sense that we would have the possibility to really recreate more human-sized structures. This means a layout of flexibility. I mean, if you walk in the center of the city, you can see that there is still a huge, a huge footprint of what transportation has been in the, in the 200 last years. In the future, maybe, this footprint will disappear because of the mobility solutions that are fully integrated. The architects, today the architects, are basically, in my opinion, the people who are, who are the most influential on how our life can change. In the sense that the architects have this very difficult uh, task to try to put all elements together that are connected to our life and try to make it the most efficient possible. And as I mentioned, to, for the moment, all the environments have been created based on either cars or trains or airplanes, whereas in the future, you could eventually create an environment, an environment for people, which I think is the most, imp most important. You could reduce design constraints. Imagine, for example, what happens if you have traffic congestion. You need to widen the road. You need to increase the amount of, of, of space connected to, to transportation, which has a huge consequence on everything, and sometimes it is not possible. I have lived in India for four years, and I have seen, actually, that because of transportation that is, that is still very, very rigid, cities are not able to so find solutions in order to develop properly. You could think about multi-layering. If you have looked at some science fiction movies, and for example, Metropolis is a good example, you can see actually that in this concept, you have a multi-layering of transportation. You have a separation of vehicles, you have a separation of, of, of uh, pedestrians, and you have vehicles flying around. Today, we are still in a very two-dimensional two -dimensional, uh, uh, environment, which of course puts constraints to every user of these environments. What I would say is that in the future, living spaces could be designed for people and not for cars. So I'm working for the car, uh, car industry, of course, which means that the car industry is trying to understand what is going to happen in the future. But I think that we have reached a stage where the automobile needs to be different in order to survive.
Of course, you have other means of transportation as well, but it is still the automobile that is the, the most uh, creating the biggest footprint on our planet. The mobility providers there, of course, are very interested in the changes that are going to happen. It is true that they panic because they don't know how their product is going to have to evolve in the future in order to integrate in these new, in these new environments. But on the other hand, it, it, offer, it gives a lot of very interesting possibilities. For example, the traditional manufacturers or the traditional mobility supp uh, suppliers are used to change their thought pro are, are needed to, uh, to change their uh, thought process because of the societal changes which means that the traditional schemes of an architectures will change or disappear so i'm talking really about an integrated concept and not about small elements that have to change most probably the automobile is going to become a service Manufacturers are still selling the product as an emotional element connected to driving. But in the future, it is not going to be driving that is going to be the emotional part. And this is something that will really change things because it will allow you actually to fully integrate mobility into the ecosystem. The product will be closer to the user. Today, we still have to adapt to the product. But the future is the product that adapts to the user, that adapts to the experiences of the user. The other thing is that we probably will shift from mass production to fully customized production. As I said, if you are working in the experimental, wor experiential world, which is hospitality or retail, you are already used to that. And in the, in the future mobility solutions w are actually going into this direction as well. The product is going to be much more user-centered. And what is very important, new mob new solutions will be offered by new players. And these new players will actually push to a change because they don't have a predefined idea about what mobility should be. If you have heritage and you have been working with your heritage for 100 years, sometimes your tunnel vision is so narrow that you cannot change. I think that the frontier between the different mobility solutions will disappear as well. I mentioned before, when you are traveling today, you still need to, to plan somehow. And a lot of people, and I say, depending on which area you live, still don't consider that, non, that uh, a public transportation system is something that is idea. But with the new mobility solutions, these frontiers will disappear and therefore will definitely have an influence on how we live and how we work. I like to use this quote, I have never learned that, I have learned that people forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So this is Maya Angelou, she is a civil rights activist from the United States, and uh, I think this quote is very strong, because basically we are moving to a change in the sense that we are shifting from an object-oriented experience to an emotional experience. I think this is really very important. It's the user who define what they prefer rather than being forced into a mold. And I think that we can see really that the object becomes almost irrelevant the users overthrow the primary function of the object in the sense that every designer and every creative person is trying to find a solution in order to make sure that he craves to the user's experiences. We cannot really do that because as soon as we introduce an object, the user will hack it or change it and therefore uh, it will become more what he needs. What is interesting as well is that the physical experience is definitely going to become much less important than it was. So there is a debate if analog and digital are in conflict, as I said, or if the digital is going to overcome, but it is definitely going to be an extension. So to a certain extent, we are now in the emotional age. We are in the economy of attention, in a sense that people are more interested into what they experience 
than what they actually possess or what they really want. And you can actually see that in the luxury world as well, where it's not possession so much that defines luxury, but more the experience you have and the way you are being conveyed in a story. So to a certain extent, time becomes more important than the motion itself. And if you look at how people behave in, 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 in mobility solutions where they're not active in the movement, time is something that has become much more relevant than uh, the way you actually move. I think that what is going to happen as well is that the five senses of the user are going to be much, much more involved than today. As we are shifting from object to experience, this will give us well a possibility to tailor the product much, much more towards what the user wants and what the user needs than today. Inclusiveness will increase. The question, of course, is to understand if more is always necessarily better, and that is why we will see how the connection between analog and digital is going to be working out. If we look at how things are changing, we can see that in the past the icon, the object, was relevant for the experience and for the emotional connection. Whereas today, slowly we are moving to a system in the sense that the object itself has no relevance anymore if it is not offered with an experience and with, a, uh, with an adventure or a story that is connected to it. So the mobility solutions are part of the system and the experience is re related to more than one object. Therefore, the mobility can become an integrator of this experience as it is moving from what the traditional object is to the system. And there, of course, as I mentioned before, analog alone will not be sufficient and digital will slowly take over. That doesn't mean that the physical world will not exist anymore, obviously, because we are still human beings, but the, the border will be more and more integrative. If you look at mobility today, it is basically based on speed and it is based on getting from one place to the other. If we are looking at the emotional part integrated into the project, that means that physical speed might actually be compensated by virtual speed. Maybe we will not need to travel in the, fu in the future anymore because systems will allow us to go from one place to the other virtually. If you look at how mobility in the future is, we, are, we can talk about seamless transitions in the sense that it is becoming an uninterrupted experience and that we will carry the world around us. I showed you this clouds, this fluffiness in the beginning. We are more and more used to have things being around us that go with us so that we really feel comfortable and at home. All systems will become one. And I simplify a lot because I'm already a little bit late. Um, which means that if all systems become one, we will, we will feel really comfortable in any kind of situations. Mobility will become more than a physical movement. I think this is very interesting because basically we are still have this concept that if we want to do something in one place or we want to go in one place, we would like to actually be there which is not very economical, which is not very good for the environment, etc., etc. So, of course, we need to be able to, to move, but the physical movement itself is not going to be a necessity. So, teletransportation has been built yet, but today this will happen. It will, of course, solve a lot of problems. But uh, Google, for example, is working on systems where you already can physically virtually move from one place to an, the other and a really experience what you would experience if you were in this other place without moving. It is to a certain extent a multi-directional approach. We move from 3D to 4D in a sense that we were just thinking about air, ground and sea, whereas today we are thinking about time, experience and alteration which actually creates this continuity. Mobility is not only a physical movement anymore, it is really something that is completely different. What is going to happen as well is that costs are going to go down most probably. And because of that, it will be offered to more people worldwide. 
And I was mentioning the fact that we are just thinking about little islands today because we are surrounded by our, by our thought process, we are surrounded by our technology, but actually solutions need to be worked on on a global base. Analog and digital extension, the mobility will be integrated. Our personal cloud is our environment. We will transfer from an actual environment to a mobile environment. I think it's already the case a little bit. Everybody has a cell phone and has actually his little world in his cell phone. So we do not need really to be in a physical environment to experience what we are doing. We are already in, to a certain extent in a digital environment as we have all our little world in this, this machine. And if you look at the technology that needs to be implemented for these mobility solutions, I'm sure that you are aware of the fact that there are a lot of discussions about integration, surveillance, data, etc., etc. We will definitely not be alone anymore. Just very briefly, it means that there will be a huge strategy shift into what mobility are. There is going to be a huge strategy, strategy shift in many, many of, uh, environments. The automotive world is already changing vocabulary. They're already not putting their main product in the forefront. They are actually integrating their product in many, many other items that have nothing to do with the automotive industry. And this is definitely going to happen with many, many people as well. Jobs will change. Jobs that don't exist today will have to be invented. And I just need to mention a couple of other things like vehicle dealerships or uh, airlines, travel industry, if the mobility solutions are going to be integrated and more autonomous, all the concepts of travel are going to be different. So I would like just to uh, mention one book which is called Quality Land, which is written by Mark uwe Kling. It is the story about a future world where mobility solutions are integrated and I would recommend it because what is interesting about this book is that it actually describes what is going to happen once we live in a world where vehicles have personalities and where systems actually tell us what to do because they are so predictive. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, I hope that everything has been clear. And if you have any questions, I know I talked a little bit more, but if you have any questions, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Dominique. I mean, you speak about um, emotions yes. uh, being important in your beautiful quote. Well, my emotion is that I'm currently quite excited about the future that you paint. Um, your job description is something like um, the lead of advanced design. I would say it should be something of lead advanced thinking. Uh, it was quite a mind-blowing presentation, quite abstract also. Um, please reveal one or two players that are getting to the point where you think we will, we will be heading to today. I mean, is it Tesla? Is it another company that we don't know of? Can you be more specific, gla looking in your glazed, uh, glazed crystal ball uh, and predicting what the future will be like and naming one or two companies or designers going in the direction that you uh, just uh, pointed out? Well, I mean, basically, uh I am not allowed to talk about what we are doing if you're talking about these developments in the future. But I think that if you look at the new players, so the companies that don't have an automotive or a mobility solution or, mobility or transportation history are the ones that are most probably the ones that are getting into uh, what could be the most interesting. If you look at, for example, uh, startups that build small little moving pods that are autonomous, today they don't look very, very appealing. Uh, they don't look very interesting, but we don't know how they're going to be in 10 years. If you look about the automotive, if you talk about the, aut the hardcore automotive industry, I think that many of the manufacturers are working on solutions that go into what we expect to happen, but they still, in my opinion, haven't understood that they need to reconsider their product radically in order to uh, convey to what is really being needed, because. Uh, the automotive industry is still trying to place a product architecture that is the same than 100 years ago. 
And this is something that has happened with Kodak, for example. It has happened with a lot of companies that had not the capability to change completely their mind. But I would say that maybe cities in the future are going to have, actually, to have their own fleets or maybe uh, libraries or hotels, it doesn't really matter. When I say that the ecosystem is fully integrated, it means that people who are working on future solutions have such a flexible mind, and especially if you talk about the new generation, people that are much younger than you and me, who have a completely different approach about what a product is because they do not have a connection to the history. I think heritage is something that is positive, but it is negative as well in the sense that it doesn't help people to think differently. Thank you very much, You're welcome. Dominique. A warm applause, please, for Dominique Taffin.